Since 1923, Benito Mussolini has been working to fulfill his vision of a new Roman-style Italian empire by subjugating those large parts of North Africa that had once been colonies under Roman rule two millennia ago. And now in Libya, this process concludes with a murder. Welcome to Between Two Wars, a chronological summary of the interwar years, covering all facets of life, the uncertainty, hedonism and euphoria, and ultimately humanity's descent into the darkness of the Second World War. I'm Indy Nidell. It is 1931, and since we last saw Mussolini, he's increased his power and been dictator of Italy since 1927. Formally, he is only head of the government, and King Victor Emmanuel III is still head of state. But without protest, the monarch has signed into law one reform after the other that has granted Mussolini absolute power and turned Italy into a totalitarian fascist state. Now, ever since he started the fascist movement, he's been promoting a mythical connection between ancient Rome and modern Italy to justify his expansive ideas for an Italian empire to rule over vast parts of the central portion of the Mediterranean, or as the Romans once called it, and the fascists have now adopted Mare Nostrum, our sea. A central part of that plan is to expand and gain full control over the portions of North Africa captured from the Ottoman Empire just before the Great War. Domains that Mussolini now styles as Libya, a name that harks back to the old Roman name for its colonies there, which in turn was adapted from the ancient Egyptian name for some of the tribes in the region. Learn something new every day. Mussolini starts this campaign, the Reconquista della Libia, the reconquest or pacification of Libya, a year after he becomes prime minister in 1923. But Italian interest in the region goes back to shortly after the creation of Italy in 1861. The colonial interests of the European powers are driven by the promise of increased natural resources and cheap labor. But there's also the imperial concept of national greatness, and Italy wants its place in the sun, too. In the 1880s, the young Italian kingdom becomes a late and relatively weak addition to the scramble for Africa. She initially makes modest inroads in Eritrea and Somalia. But after an attempt to colonize Abyssinia, the Ethiopian Empire, Italy faces a disastrous defeat against the Ethiopians at the Battle of Adwa in 1896, effectively ending Italian expansion for the next 15 years. In 1911, they make another attempt to gain a foothold when they go to war with the Ottoman Empire to conquer the provinces Tripolitania, Cyrenaica, and Fezzan. It is a financially costly war for Italy. Prime Minister Giovanni Giolitti had predicted an immediate and decisive military victory. But that turns out to be a miscalculation, and they spend 1.3 billion lira, a billion more than planned. However, in October 1912, the First Balkan War breaks out. The Ottomans now need all of their forces in the Balkans, and a peace treaty is signed, with Italy as the new master of what will, in 1934, once again be known as Libya. But it turns out that not all new subjects of the Italian king are delighted with their new rulers. Italy faces widespread unrest and must deploy the military to keep control. Moreover, Italy's entry into the Great War in 1915 forces the Italian government to shift its attention to the war in Europe. In an effort to keep power but spare their forces, they pull back to coastal African cities such as Tripoli and Benghazi. In the resulting vacuum, resistance to Italian rule quickly grows into outright war. The leaders of the opposition to Italian rule are the Senussi, a political and religious movement tracing back to a mystical Muslim order founded by theologian Sayyid Muhammad bin Ali el Sanusi in 1837. The Sanusi are at the core of the anti-colonial movement and had effectively fought off eastward expansion by the French in the noughts. At their head since 1911 is the teacher turned rebel Omar Mukhtar, also known as the Lion of the Desert. He is a fierce, adaptive, and resourceful military commander and is dedicated to religious piety, swearing off personal gain and creature comforts. Even his Italian counterparts come to admire him for his prowess and dedication. In an effort to weaken both Italy and Britain, the Ottoman Sultan now encourages the thousands of tribesmen organized by Mukhtar to rise up and carry out raids in both Libya and British-controlled Egypt. 
But the Ottomans are under increasing pressure in the world war and can't give Mukhtar the support he really needs to prevail. So the Senussi sign a peace treaty with both of those European powers in April 1917. But this does not really cement Libya as an Italian colony. Although Italy is formally given dominion in the Treaty of Lausanne, in effect, the region continues to be controlled by the Senussi. Not much is done about it at first, as domestic Italian concerns take center stage with all the post-war instability. But in 1922, Italian colonial power is under increasing threat. Stiffening Cyrenaic and resistance and the nominal Egyptian independence, which we covered in our episode about carving up the Middle East, pushes the Italian government to consider military pacification. For the fascists, this is good news. With bitterness over the relatively minor territorial gains given in Paris 1919, Libya now presents itself as the perfect opportunity for the nascent fascist government to demonstrate its military prowess. In 1923, Mussolini decides to go to war in Africa once again. Now, all of that might sound like Italian soldiers have been and are going to be fighting in Africa against indigenous soldiers trying to regain control of their own lands, but it isn't quite that simple. Already during the teens, most of the Italian fighting done in Libya is actually done by Eritrean and Somali legionnaires. Attracted by steady pay, an escape from the natural fluctuations of their agrarian economy, these recruits turn out to be loyal and effective fighters. The Italian officers soon develop the view that colonial troops are better suited to the climate and terrain than Italian soldiers. Colonel Guglielmo Nassi, one of the senior figures in Italian East Africa, even goes so far as to say that Italian troops are a hindrance and a ball and chain on military commanders in the field. These are positive attributes sometimes based on vague racial understanding even when meant to be praise, such as when General Ottorino Mezzetti, one of the commanders of the troops in Libya, notes that the Eritreans feel excited and develop in the fight the bestial instincts of a warrior race. But there are other, more important factors that push Italy to use local recruits. First of all, they're cheaper than Italian troops. In 1926, an Italian private is paid two and a quarter lira daily, with an additional three and a half if serving in a colony. Those from East Africa get one and a half daily, with an additional one if serving outside their native colony. They also receive, and accept, smaller food rations than their native Italian counterparts. Third of all, it enables the Italian government to avoid opposition by the war-tired Italian population for sacrificing more Italian lives in yet another war abroad. Or, as historian Giulia Barrera puts it, by using Eritreans, and not Italians, the Italian government was able to continue pursuing an expansionist colonial policy in Somalia and Libya without running the risk of the political backlash that the death of Italian soldiers could have caused. But it poses a problem of over-reliance on local manpower, which spills over to the Italian colonial administrators in, for example, Eritrea. Between 1912 and 1934, the East African colony's small population of roughly half a million will furnish 68 battalions and six artillery batteries in rotation. That causes concerns about labor shortage in the largely agrarian but increasingly industrial territory. Officials in Eritrea's capital, Asmara, clash continuously with Rome about this throughout the 1920s. It's only by 1929, the tensions are reduced after a plague of locusts makes the voluntary two-year military service a means of reducing unemployment and destitution. While all of this fills the ranks of the Italian forces, it is one of many factors that now wreaks havoc on social structures. Now, this is a war against insurgency, so there are no clear front lines and, and few major actual battles. Instead, it plays out through repeated widespread raids and attacks on Italian strongholds by the rebels. Mukhtar has organized the rebels into highly mobile squads and created a support network within the tribal communities in Libya. Mukhtar and his men know the terrain like their own backyards and are able to stealthily move and strike without warning, much to the frustration of the Italians. 
From 1923 to 1930, Mukhtar's rebels continue their actions, but the Italians respond with militarized police action, with increasing intensity and brutality, especially after the declaration of jihad, holy war for all Muslims, by the most militant wing of the Senussi. To close off the possibility of retreat into safe havens in British Egypt, they erect a 350 kilometer long barbed wire fence along the Libyan-Egyptian border and create a highly militarized zone with armored vehicles and aircraft patrolling the sector continuously. The local population's livelihood is badly damaged as they depend on an open border exchange, especially the partly nomadic Bedouin, who are also major supporters of the Senussi. In March 1930, General Rodolfo Graziani takes command of the Italian forces in Libya. Graziani is determined to achieve a complete victory. He starts carrying out organized retaliatory actions against rebel support by the widespread slaughter of livestock, closing down the vital desert wells and isolating 100,000 of the Bedouin population in 11 concentration camps, surrounded by barbed wire and machine guns. Tens of thousands perish from the abysmal conditions in the camps. Throughout Libya, contact with the rebels becomes a capital offense, leading to immediate execution. Through systematic torture, deportation, and impoverishment, Graziani is hellbent on crushing the insurgency. The amount of people murdered and disappeared is unclear, as there is no census by which to definitely determine casualties. It is safe to say, though, that it is in the high tens of thousands, possibly more. Graziani's campaign of terror is efficient, and by the end of the year, the Senussi's capacity to move and strike freely has been significantly reduced. Despite this, Mukhtar continues to elude them and continues a limited campaign harassing the Italian forces. During the summer of 1931, it becomes a main objective of Graziani's forces to capture Mukhtar. On September 11th, he's wounded in a battle near Slonta, a town south of the city Beda. Incapacitated, he is finally captured and brought to a POW camp in Saluk. On the 16th of September 1931, the now 73-year-old Omar Mukhtar is hanged in front of his followers. He accepts his fate with the words, from Allah we come, and to Allah we must return. His nemesis Graziani will later say, Omar was endowed with a quick and lively intelligence, was knowledgeable in religious matters, and revealed an energetic and impetuous character, unselfish and uncompromising. Ultimately, he remained very religious and poor, even though he had been one of the most important Senussist figures. Historian Angelo Del Boca summarizes Mukhtar like this. Omar is not only an example of religious faith and a born fighter, but also the builder of that perfect military political organization, which for 10 years kept in check troops under four governors. The execution of the Lion of the Desert is met with widespread indignation throughout the Arab world, but the war is over for now, and the Italians proceed to consolidate their gains. The plan is to settle Italian farmers in towns and villages either newly constructed or claimed from the indigenous population. It's a mixture of land seizure and forcing the sale of land at low prices. The state-run Libyan Colonization Society has plans to settle half a million native Italians in Libya over the next three decades. The original inhabitants will be relocated to less arable and less valuable land, with lesser attractive model villages created in which to force the nomadic population to settle. By 1939, some 110,000 Italians will have arrived, so around 12% of the population will be native Italian. However, they'll be concentrated on the Mediterranean coastline, mainly around Tripoli and Benghazi, where they make up a third of the population. While the colonial masters also invest in infrastructure like roads, electricity, railroads, irrigation, ports, the indigenous population will see little improvement and will continue to suffer from the wartime destruction and the ensuing attrition of the rural economic life. This creates the first major urban migration wave in the region for many centuries, concentrating the social problems that have now arisen in the cities, though attempts will be made 
to expand health services for the locals, they will be limited. The same goes for access to education. With only 120 Arabs attending the only secondary school in Tripoli for indigenous students in 1939. However, the Italians have learned from their mistakes and do not continue a militaristic program of intimidation, instead seeking local support for their endeavors, despite continuing inequalities between Italians and Libyans. In fact, they want to integrate the northern shore of Libya as the Quarta Sponda, the fourth shore, into Italy proper rather than as a distinct colonial entity. The colony now begins mirroring homeland institutions, so that when, for instance, mainland Italy has the fascist youth organization Opera Nazionale Balilla, which is the Italian equivalent of the Hitler Youth, Libya gets the Giovento Araba del Littorio, Arab Littoral Youth. For some indigenous adults, membership will even be open in the Associazione Musulmana del Littorio, the local Muslim branch of the National Fascist Party. Additionally, Libyans will be granted a middle status of colonial citizenship. Though not fully equal, this does pave the way for a theoretical path to a modified form of citizenship, conditional on a certain level of Italian education and loyalty to Italy. You see, as odd as it might sound, Mussolini, with his traditional Catholic upbringing, does not promote hatred of Muslims. Instead, he makes a concerted effort to increase cooperation with the Muslim world. According to his son-in-law, Galeazzo Siano's diary, Il Duce even wants to build a mosque in Rome as a projection of its relationship to the Islamic world, though he backs down after papal opposition. In Libya, he titles himself Protettore dell'Islam, Protector of Islam, once the title of the caliphs of the recently abolished Ottoman Caliphate. But as always with Il Duce, there's a twist and a cunning plan in the making. You see, most of the Islamic world is ruled by France and Great Britain at this point, and the leader of the fascists wants to put a wedge in that relationship. He also still has his eyes on Abyssinia, where there is a long-standing conflict between the Arab-influenced Muslims and the Amharic-speaking Orthodox elite that governs there. So, in essence, Mussolini is already making plans for a new conflict with the other colonial powers and continued colonial expansion. It's all part of what Mussolini and the fascists call the destino africano del popolo italiano, the African destiny of the Italian peoples, a belief that they have somehow inherited the rights to the ancient Roman colonies. It is a belief and ambition that sets them on a path of conflict that will tip the power scales in the entire world in 1935, when Italy once again wages war on the Ethiopian Empire. During the ensuing Abyssinian crisis, Italy faces massive protests by the League of Nations, while the US, France, and Great Britain secretly try to appease the situation. It ends in chaos, as France and Great Britain's underhand operations are leaked to the public. Massive sanctions are imposed on Italy, who quits the League of Nations in protest and still seizes three quarters of the Ethiopian Empire during the Second Italo-Abyssinian War. If the League of Nations had ever been a functioning organization is doubtful, but it is this incident that puts the final nail in its coffin. Through all of that mess, Italy does get support from its Nazi associates in Germany, though, so that after the crisis, the fascists and Nazis find themselves isolated together with the more democratic Western powers as common opposition. If that is a tipping point is questionable, but they will in any case soon be full out allies, first under the anti common turn pact and then military allies under the Pact of Steel or Rome-Berlin Axis. In Eastern Africa, it makes Italy and Great Britain neighboring enemy powers on multiple fronts. Come 1940, it is on these fronts that Italy and Great Britain will begin that part of World War II known as the North African Campaign. Raging for two years, 11 months and three days, it will once again cost thousands and thousands of lives in yet another effort to control the valuable resources and strategic positions in Africa and the Middle East. If you have not seen our episode about how the Middle East was carved up after World War I, 
You'll see a link here in just a moment. Also check out the weekly episode of World War II when hostilities between Italy and Great Britain come to Africa in 1940. Our Time Ghost Army member for this week is Troy Willis. It's thanks to the financial contribution by people like Troy that we are able at all to make all of our fantastic shows. So do like Troy and join the forces at patreon.com or timegoesnottv. Now activate that bell, otherwise YouTube will not notify you. My salama. Don't worry, it's not alcoholic. Mm-hmm.